Good evening, family, wherever you are. Let's begin with the song. I hope you had a great family night last night. And I don't want you to forget this song from Psalm 46.1. My voice is kind of froggy, so I'm going to start it real low. But you sing it out loud, okay? God is our refuge and God is our strength. A very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and God is our strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore I will not fear though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. And if you heard the news tonight, uh, the weatherman says there is a potential hurricane or storm coming our way, but we can rebuke it in Jesus' name. I want us to take that authority and speak to that storm to just die in the ocean. Let's unite in prayer. There is power in unity and power in our faith. So gather around with your family and let's pray for peace on our island, peace in our homes, and safety for all of us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we consider it a privilege to come together as a family. We feel safer when we are together and praying for one another. And we rebuke that storm that's coming our way. And we ask, Lord, that you divert it for it to die in the midst of the sea. That it will not cause any harm. It will not cause any damage. It will not take any lives. In Jesus' name, we take the power of the storm out of it. And we pray for peace. And we pray, Lord, that you will use it to bring you glory. Help us to get aligned with your word. And tonight, we pray for those who are needing uh, prayers like Pastor David De La Cruz and Davina, who's going through some treatments. We thank you for strengthening Wayne. We pray for the Currys that are with their grandchildren. Protect them as they travel. And tonight we open our hearts, Lord, how we need you. Lord, we thank you that you are a very present help in the time of trouble. So make us have listening ears to things that you want us to hear personalize the word to everyone we pray in Jesus name amen well Sunday I asked you some questions before I started I don't know how many of you remember the question but I'm going to ask you another question tonight you know we come from all diverse uh, racial backgrounds cultural backgrounds in this church we have a whole spectrum and uh, we think that we're so different. But tonight I'd like for you to contemplate while I'm ministering on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember we said we talked about salvation, how we become born again. After we become born again, we get sanctified. That means we die to ourselves. We realize that we need to start over again like a newborn baby. And through Jesus Christ, he gives us that new life. And then he gives us this power. And some of you have been experiencing the power and life of the Holy Spirit. And tonight we're going to talk about some of the giftings that he gives to us. Okay, but what, uh, you know, when you look at all of us and you look at each other, what are some of the things that we share in common? Just, just ordinary things. I'll start it off. Number one, we were all born, right? None of you was hatched. We're all born kind of through the same kind of birth uh, experience. So that's in common. We will all one day die, right? We don't know of anybody who has lived forever except Jesus. He went through the physical death, but he raised, was raised again. But, you know, we don't count him. But nobody ever lives forever, even the richest man. So... We're all born, we're all gonna die. During our lifetime, we all have 
relational problems, don't we? Maybe you were born into a dysfunctional family, or maybe you married a dysfunctional person, or they think they married a dysfunctional person, so you may have relational problems, but all of us have some kind of relational problems in our lifetime. Maybe it's with our boss, or it's with our employee, or it could be with the in-laws, or the outlaws, you know what I'm saying? But we all have relational problems. We have that in common, all right? We have broken romances, and a lot of times people are going through broken marriages. So relational uh, problems are something I believe all of us have experienced or will experience in our lifetime. Another area I think that we share in common, a pro common problem in our lifetime is a financial thing. You know, you grow up and your parents provided for you, then you've got to look for a job, and all your life you're thinking how you're going to be supported. The men, uh, you know, look for a career, and nowadays women look for a career too. And many households have two careers there trying to make it go. And, well, you might say, well, what about those that are rich? Do you know the rich have more problems, I think, than those who are struggling and make it from day to day? Because they're always worried how they're going to keep their wealth, how they're going to make some more money to maintain their lifestyle. You know, when you're rich, you have to have a nice big house and a nice big car and wear fancy clothes and... I don't know if they're really that much ahead of us, except that they look better than us with all those fancy things, but they've got tremendous worries, and a lot of times when there is an up and down in the stock market and so forth, many of them commit suicide. So they have financial worries too, even if they're rich. So if you're feeling poor, don't worry. You know, they said during this pandemic, the stock market crashed and went up and went down and so forth. Well, you know what? I never worried one day in, in, during this pandemic about the stock market because I don't have stocks. You know, I live from day to day. Many of you do too. But finances can be a problem. And all of us at some time in our life I think will feel the stress if you're not doing it right now because some of you have lost your jobs so you've been displaced and your situation is not what it used to be. Uh, you're feeling some financial problems. So I think finances are kind of a universal thing to go through. The other thing could be our health. Some people are born healthy. Some people are born not as healthy. Some have birth defects. Some have genetically inherited diseases. Some of us who are born 8 pounds, 13 ounces as I was, you know, we grow up and we eat a lot of french fries and hamburgers. And, you know, you can do that when you're 25 and 30, but by the time you get 45, if you don't moderate your diet and eat sensibly, then you start having aches and pains and diabetes and heart problems and high cholesterol and high blood pressure and all of that. And I think that we have to walk the fine line. Now they're giving a lot of good you know, information, but the discipline of doing it. You know, so anyway, I think all of us have some kind of concern about health issues in our lifetime. And surely at the end of our life, when our bodies get weaker, it is going to be a universal concern for all of us who um, go through this life. And then, of course, the fifth thing that I thought of was unexpected unhappy experiences you plan a good life you got a good family your finances are stable you've got a good job and you've got a dream for your family and then an accident happens and maybe a loved one is taken or it leaves you crippled or there are natural natural disasters that take your home or take your material things or somebody's lifestyle, somebody's evil plot against you comes and, and ruins your life. These are unexpected, unhappy surprises, and I think most of us will not go through life not having something like this happen unexpectedly and make us change the way we look at life. Well, 
I tell you the good news. The reason why we study the Bible is because God knew that we were going to have a rough life. After he gave, created man and created everything for our pleasure, the sun, moon, and stars, coordinating and beautifying the night stars, sky and the flowers and the fruits and the vegetables and the grass and you know all these beautiful animals and all for us to enjoy. Remember in the Garden of Eden, God gave man the choice to believe him and obey him or disobey him. And we know the sad story is that Adam and Eve disobeyed him and gave their authority that God had given them to rule this beautiful earth to Satan who had fallen from heaven because of his pride and because his evil desire to become God. So, now that we're born after that, we're born with a sin nature that we inherited from our parents, Adam and Eve, and we're under the authority and dominion of Satan. So, you know, you leave a child alone, and they don't gravitate to becoming better. You leave them alone, and they'll, they'll turn to be naughty and bad. You don't have to teach them how to lie or steal or do any of these bad things because this is the nature, and our nature is to disobey God. So the Old Testament tells us how God the Father set everything in order after man chose to follow Satan and they chose to do evil things and turn away from him and dishonor him. He let them kind of do what they wanted and everybody started doing what was right in their own eyes. Kind of just like how we're doing right now. We don't like law and order anymore. I mean, li listen to the evening news. If you don't believe that we're living in the last days where God is once again going to let us do what we want in our own eyes, and if we don't choose him, he's going to let happen what we're seeing happen now. And this is why I preach the gospel and I teach, because I want to pluck sinners from hell. I want their lives to be better, and I want our nation and our world to be better if we know the word of God. So God gave in the Old Testament his laws through Moses. He chose Abraham to be the father of a nation that he said he will work out his purpose and there would be like a demonstration of his plan. And uh, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, he picks up a man who refuses to believe that there are many gods. I guess out of all the people that were living at that time, Abraham was the only one that believed that there must be only one God. These other gods are crazy, stone and wood and silver and gold and you know images of animals and the sun and all of that. And he believed that there was one God. So God said to Abraham, I'm going to choose you as a nation. You're going to be a mighty nation. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, they will be blessed because of you. And that's the nation of Israel. And it was returned back to their homeland. And so we, uh, as Christians, love the Jewish people. My mom, when she became converted, started reading this very passage and she loved the nation of Israel, loved the Jewish people, and she spent her money, her retirement money, getting some Russian Jews back to their homeland in Israel. And so Abraham had a nation, and then God gave through Moses the laws. How many of you know that families need laws or rules? Does your family have a rule? You have to be in it by a certain time. Everybody has an assigned chore, especially if mom and dad are working. You give an age-appropriate chore to a child, and you bless them because you're making them not lazy. You give them an assignment. You keep them accountable. But there are a lot of thou shall not and thou shall do in every family or any organization. It has to have rules so that we don't become chaotic. And when God gave the rules... 
One of my favorite chapters, one of my favorite books, I told you my book, favorite book in the entire Bible was Romans, but one of my favorite books in the Old Testament is in Deuteronomy. It's one of the five basic books of the Jews, but in Deuteronomy it talks about how we can have an abundant life. We Gentiles, non-Jews, through Jesus Christ the Messiah, we were grafted in and we were adopted And my favorite chapter in Deuteronomy is chapter 28 because he says, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord. See, in the Garden of Eden, God says, if you obey me, you have no worries. You can eat everything. You don't have to work. You can just enjoy everything. But he gave them a choice, and they chose wrong. So he gives a second chance by giving us laws that will keep our family, our nation, our world in order, and he says this, if you will do this, if you will obey me, then I will bless you, and all the blessings will come down upon you, and it says it will overtake you. So I like to read Deuteronomy 28, okay? And the last part says, but if you don't, this is what's going to happen. That's why I like the Bible. It's very honest. It tells you the right way, And it gives you the choice to either obey God, who's smarter than I am, probably smarter than you are. I hope you think so. Or he says, if you disobey, like he said to Adam and Eve, this is what's going to happen. It's not going to be good. So if you'd like to read it, read it in your recreation time. It's really good. But God made everything perfect. He gave laws and he gave blessings. So that's the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, he, sent, he came down as the incarnate God, Jesus Christ. God in the flesh came. And he said, when you choose wrong, when you disobey me, you sin. And you are designed. Remember we said God has a plan that started in the beginning. And God's plan has an end. And he gave us signs as to when the end is going to come. Because, he says, at the end of your life, whenever that is, if you believe in me, you can come to heaven. Or if you are living in the time when Jesus comes back again as he promised, we can go to heaven to be with our Father. So he gives us this plan, but he gives us a choice. You know, not everybody goes to heaven, even if Oprah says everybody's going to end up in heaven or everybody's going to be an angel. Do you know you're not going to be an angel you never were an angel here, so you're not going to be an angel up there. God, does, We're going to be better than angels. Right now, the Bible says we're made lower than the angels. But when we get to heaven, do you know the Bible tells us that the angels are going to fold their wings and hear Carol sing? She loves to sing. He's going to hear us sing. They're going to fold their wings because they were never redeemed. We will have a song. When we get to heaven, it's going to be so wonderful. Even those of us who cannot sing like me will start singing the glory of God and thanking him for redeeming us. Oh, this is the most beautiful place. I mean, the two options are so so different. One is so bad and the other is so good that... Anybody in their right mind should choose what is so wonderful and free. The other one we have to earn. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so you earn going to hell. But Jesus paid for you to be set free in the courts of heaven. Jesus paid for you to be set free. And you can go to heaven. That's the glorious news of the gospel. So don't be so busy running around in this life. The Bible says, what shall it profit a person if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? You're not that crazy, are you? I hope not. Heaven is free. We just have to be humble and receive that free gift. But I remember, you know... I teach new converts all the time, and it's like when you cross over the line from Satan's camp, he's pulling to take you to hell. Remember I told you hell was not made for human beings. So if you happen to be there, you chose to be there. You invited yourself because 
Jesus wanted you to go to heaven by renouncing your sin. Hell was made to destroy sin. And if you're still attached to your sin, then you're going to be destroyed with it because heaven is a holy place. We're not going because we're perf perfect. We're going to heaven because we are pardoned. We have had freedom from our sins, and Jesus paid it all, so we have a ticket to heaven. God is so wonderful in giving us this free life. But you know, when Jesus was going, remember I said uh, in one of the classes, the Gospel of Luke was written by Dr. Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. So if you want to have continuity in the early church, read the Gospel of Luke and then flip over to the, gospel, to the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, the things that they did. Jesus says, I'm going soon to be away, but I will send you another comforter, not one to run alongside and teach you as I have, but he's going to be inside of you. So God the Father set the law. God the Son freed us from the penalty of the sin of breaking the law. And God the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. Jesus says, I'm going back to heaven. I'm going to be seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. I will constantly make intercession for you. Listen, have you had a hard day? Have you called somebody and maybe they didn't answer the phone? I think somebody said that somebody's not answering the phone. Let me tell you this. Jesus was looking down and he was praying for you. Did you know that? You don't have to pray for saints. You don't have to pray for whatever. You know that if you belong to Jesus, even if you're not aware of danger, he is praying for you. That's the advantage of knowing him as your personal savior. Like all the problems we've mentioned, the financial problems, the health problems, the relational problems, do you know in the Bible if you obey them, you will have a happy family, you will have your financial needs and your needs for everyday living to be taken care of. You will have health and healing because Jesus paid for it on the cross and he's got a formula and that's why we study it. And as we obey it, we have the blessings of the Lord. And as we disobey it, then we have, okay, the consequences. So he fills us with his Holy Spirit. And some of you had some experiences that's fantastic. It was like the second chapter of the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit came as a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues of fire sat on everybody who said the 120 there and they began to praise God and speak in other tongues. And some of you had that experience. Well, that was the beginning. And tonight I'd like to show you that that was something that sets us up for the family. Okay. In, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it tells us about the gifts that God wants to give to us, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Verses 7 to 11. When the Holy Spirit comes, and some of you said, you know, I felt the wind of the Holy Spirit. I felt something wonderful, but I have not spoken in tongues. Do not worry. Somebody asked, can I go to heaven if I don't speak in tongues? Of course you can. All that qualifies you to go to heaven is that you believe and you're humble enough to receive the forgiveness of Jesus for your sins. Like the thief on the cross. You know, the Lord says, today you're going to be with me in paradise, not until you get baptized or whatever. And so, even if you don't have tongues, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Just seek more of Jesus, more of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Holy Spirit baptizer. He baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. And these are the gifts, he says. He puts us in families. So we cannot operate... And some people say, I don't have to go to church. I just love Jesus and all. But that's not how he left us to operate. He set us up as families. And 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, and he makes it very simple. He says, look at your body, you know. 
You have eyes, you have ears, you have hands, you got nose, you got a big mouth, well, I do, to eat and talk, legs, you know, and all of that. And then the internal parts, the kidneys and the bladder and all of that that's not very pretty, we don't think, we, don't, we haven't seen it, but it doesn't seem like it'll be pretty. And he says, all of them are necessary. In fact, even the uncomely ones, that means the ugly things in our body are probably more important than our pretty eyes or pretty lips or pretty ears or whatever. But we're all important. And that's what he's saying. When he gave the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he says everyone will have their particular function and one may be the eye, one will be the ear, one will be the feet, and one, you know. And so I want you, as we talk about it tonight, to see where your giftings is. Your natural gifting, probably anointed by the Holy Spirit when he filled you so you can use it in the spiritual family that you're now in. There are no lone rangers in this Christian walk. We are joined to a family because whatever talent and gift you have, the body of Christ needs it. So I cannot function alone, and you cannot function alone. I cannot do what you can do, and you cannot do what I can do. But here, reading from the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 7, it says, for the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. If you're doing your job, and I'm doing my job, and she's doing her job, and he's doing his job, and we all come together like a healthy body, we can run, we can skip, we can do a lot of things together, and there's no pain. So these are the gifts that are listed. He said the spiritual gifts to make the body of Christ function. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. There's some people that are given real spiritual insight. And I believe these are the ones that love the book of Proverbs because that is the wisdom of God. And then God anoints it that when somebody wants counsel, I think we would look to that person because we know that we can trust their judgment and they're usually a prayer warrior who don't speak before they think or pray. They can follow the Holy Spirit, but they have the gift of wisdom. So be careful who you go to if you need advice. Some people are gifted for that. Number two, another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. You know, when we're worshiping together and the Holy Spirit is moving, you hear me sometimes say, there's somebody with a broken foot or somebody with, you know, some kind of headache or whatever. It's, I don't pre-think it. I don't, I'm praying in the spirit and it just flows out in English to say what is God is wanting to heal and what people are expecting and he will speak the word so their faith will come up. That is the word of knowledge or he sometimes will give a particular person with that gift knowledge of a particular event or something like that. So that's another gift, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge to another faith by the same spirit. Some people have a lot of faith, they have no fear. Whatever comes, they're calm. Their faith is grounded. They're usually in the word. They're usually full of the Holy Spirit. They're usually speaking in tongues and praying in tongues because that's how our faith grows, by the hearing of God's word and by praying in the spirit. So there are people who are gifted in that way. Maybe you're not that way. Well, it's okay, if we're in the body, we're going to benefit from their gift. And then next to another gift of healings by the same spirit, there are people in our church that have experienced healing themselves. So they really have faith for that. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit. You see them come up and help pray when people come to the altar. They're the ones that have a lot of faith for healing. We say, if you don't have faith for healing, don't come up. If you have faith that they're going to die... You know, some people say, I don't want to pray for the sick. They might die. Well, don't come up and pray. But those who have the gift of healing will come, lay hands, and pray. And all of us, let me tell you this, although there are many, many gifts, remember, we don't own any of them. We may be used, perhaps, 
as one that will bring miracles and one that God uses in particular for healings, but we don't own it. The Holy Spirit has it. So let's say that I have the gift of healing. I pray and people get healed like this, you know. But somebody is seeking wisdom and there's nobody around and they come to me and they say, you know, Pastor, I really need advice. And I'm not going to say, no, 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 I'm sorry. My gift is healing. I don't have the gift of wisdom. You got to wait till Susie comes because she's the one that got the gift of wisdom. No, no, no. We all got the Holy Spirit, and those of you, even if you're young in the Lord, do you know that because the Holy Spirit is in you and somebody wants advice, just pray quickly and say, Lord, give me the wisdom that I need to give your word to this person. So we don't own any gifts. It's the Holy Spirit in us that has all these gifts, but he will Anoint several of us, different ones, for different things to make the body strong and complete so nobody's overworked, okay? Everybody's doing their job. And then another working of miracles, another prophesying. They have spiritual insight and they uh, study about it and they know what's going to happen and God reveals that to them and they speak it out. To another, discernment of spirits. That means they're very sensitive and the kinds of spirit that enters the church or enters their home or fellowships with them, they can discern that, okay? It's not a critical spirit. Some people think, you know, that their critical spirit is a discerning spirit. I perceive that one is whatever because they don't like that person. Well, that is not from the Holy Spirit. It's knowing in your heart and you're not going to embarrass anybody and you're not going to call them up in public but you will be warned by them of them if they have a wrong spirit or soon their spirit will be manifested in you and it will be confirmed, okay? To another different kinds of tongues, I heard that somebody recently got filled with the Holy Spirit and they pray in Filipino, a Filipino dialect, wonderful. And we might have different kind of noticeable languages, or sometimes it's just what we call glossolalia. That's the language of the Holy Spirit in unknown tongue. Gift of the Holy Spirit. To another, the interpretation of tongues. When there is a speaking of tongues in a service, there should be an interpretation of it. And usually, the person that speaks in tongues, God gives the interpretation to it, but interpreting the unknown tongue is a real gift, okay? But it says, but the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually. And then in closing, I want you to look to Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8, and you can read it yourself, but I will just list the other spiritual gifts that are given in this particular passage. Number one, the gift of prophecy. To see prophetic things, to speak prophetically through the Holy Spirit. Number two, ministry is a spiritual gift. You know, you can be a great CEO out there with all the administrative skills. Doesn't make you a good minister. Because whatever gifts you have, whether it's singing or playing an instrument, you need to lay it at the altar and sanctify it and say, God, make it holy. Because when we come to worship, it's a holy presence. It's not entertainment. It's coming to worship the holy God. And so our gifts need to be made holy by our prayer and our surrender. You know, whenever I speak, I surrender to the Lord because I know that for me, it's kind of easy to speak in the public, but I don't want it to be my words. And when I feel like, oh God, I don't know what I'm gonna say, I feel like the more people are blessed because I'm depending on him more. Teaching is a spiritual gift. Exhorting, I know a lot of people fill with the spirit, they don't preach, they don't teach, but they are encouragers. And they'll give a word, not their own words only, but a scripture that's feeding the soul of somebody who's discouraged. That is a spiritual gift. And we have some who are givers. God has blessed them 
or they have a lot of faith for finances and all, and they give liberally, and that is their ministry. Giving liberally, listed in Romans chapter 12, is a spiritual gift. It's not to make you look good or you know, have people admire you. It's a spiritual gift that you give to the Lord, and most of the time you give it anonymously. Okay, And then there's a gift of uh, leading with diligence. A leader has to be very patient and focused. That is a spiritual gift. And I like the last one mentioned, the gift of mercy. I say, God, give me the gift of mercy because I need mercy a lot. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, you know. And the Lord says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you're in a place where somebody needs mercy, I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll give that unworthy one a lot of mercy because you received mercy from Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Whatever gifts, natural gifts you have, just say, Lord, I lay it down. I want it sanctified. I want it to be made holy. If you want to give it back to me as a ministry gift, you will tell me when I'm ready. But I want your Holy Spirit gifts to flow wherever there is a need. I don't have to specialize in one thing, but I'm available to be your hands extended, to be your heart, to be your voice, to be your kindness, to be your mercy, to people that I meet, that you place in my path every day. Father, we thank you. Those of us who have been saved, Lord, we have all these problems like everybody else, and yet when we go to the word and we obey the word, your promises restore everything Satan has tried to Take from us and make our lives miserable. Give us good health. Take care of our finances. Take care of our relationships, Lord. Every ungodly relationship, we pray that you will remove from us. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to be a blessing to others, that we will share the love of Jesus, that in a crisis, when we are squeezed, that they will see Jesus in us. We need your help, and we need to be filled with your Holy Spirit. In ourselves, we cannot do it. We're still human. Our reactions are still very carnal. But God, we crucify it tonight. Forgive us for our misgivings. Forgive us for not coming up to par, perhaps. You're so loving and kind and you're merciful. So as we receive the blessing of your mercy tonight, fill us with your Holy Spirit and that gift of mercy so we can reach out and share that mercy with people who feel unworthy of that mercy. Save sinners tonight. Help us to point them to the cross. Strengthen those who are tired and weary Energize those that need a fresh anointing. And Lord, we commend ourselves to your care. You love us. We're safe. You'll never cast us out. Satan may try to pull us back over that line in that tug of war, but we remember you are our anchor man and you will never let us go. You're fighting for our soul and you're ever praying for us for that. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And if there's anybody who needs to repent of your sins, just say the sim simple prayer, Jesus, thank you for taking the punishment of my sins on the cross. Please forgive me of my sins. I invite you to come in to my heart, be the Lord of my life, and fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can have the abundant life that you promised for this earth and eternal life when I die. Amen. 
Any of you said that prayer, I pray God will confirm it with signs and wonders now in your life. May you have happy surprises. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I love you all, and wherever you are, just smile at somebody and say something kind before you go to bed. Good night, and we'll see you tomorrow night for our healing service. I love you, and aloha.